Hello, and uh, thank you for coming to um, this installment of the presentations that I have been doing here now at the Hopkinton Senior Center for, mm, I think, four years? Four years, maybe? Five? I don't know. So a long time. So uh, for those of you who haven't been here, my name is Arthur Bergeron. I'm an attorney. I work at Myrick O'Connell. Um, there are, that's there. We, there, are, there are 68 of us at Myrick O'Connell. Um, and so we each get to do what we really like. I really like this. I do elder law. I do nothing but. Um, my uh, clients are typically look a lot like that, Frank and Mary, and their kids, Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr. Um, my uh, typical client age is 74. What I try to do in these presentations is to try to give you a sense of issues that you need to know about as a senior. Sometimes those are very broad. I try every year to do kind of an Elder Law 101 presentation. Some of them are very specific regarding specific uh, mass health programs and other things. And others are kind of in the middle. So this is kind of in the middle. Um, this is really about what um, my friends Frank and Mary find when I'm talking to them is their most typical problem. Frank and Mary have a very simple goal. They want to die and be buried in the backyard. Uh, and then when they uh, die, they want to ideally leave all of their assets to their, to their spouse, or if the spouse is not alive, all their assets to their kids. And the question is, um, how do they do that? And in the meantime, how do they make sure that they are able to stay in their house? Because they want to stay in their house until they die. Uh, they want to make sure that they don't run out of money. Um, that's the, always the, the everybody, every senior's worst fear is that you run out of money before you run out of time. Um, and let's say that their house is worth about $400,000 uh, and that their other assets are worth about $500,000 to give you kind of a sense of this. So we're going to be talking a lot about their, about their house and what they both definitely don't want to do is neither of them ever um, wants to go to a nursing home because they know that the nursing home for the person who goes is, is not that terrific. I spent a lot of time in nursing homes, you know, try as they might. Folks who are running nursing homes have a trouble making it really fun. And some of them just aren't fun at all. Um, but the, uh, so there are a set of, of issues that they need to be dealing with um, ahead of time if they want to be dealing with protecting their home um, for the rest of their lives in the event against the possibility that they might need nursing home care, or they might need a lot of care at home. The question is, how can they make sure that that's going to work? Because remember, they have a house, they have some assets, but they don't have like a huge amount of assets. So I'm going to talk about four things that folks talk to me about. The first thing that they usually come in talking to me about is a trust. Oh, don't I need a trust? You know, don't I need an irre irrevocable trust? Isn't that the way I'm going to need to protect my assets? And the answer to that is kind of yes and no, and we're going to talk about that a little bit more. But I really want to talk about all of the other things that they can do before we talk about trust. Now, the first thing that I often talk to folks about is long-term care insurance. Uh, I don't sell long-term care insurance. I don't get referrals to people to buy long-term care insurance. Um, but it is one of those important options for a lot of folks. Now, th the main reason, though, interestingly, to buy or to be interested in long-term care insurance typically isn't to cover your long-term care. Um, because if you're trying to cover that, the cost of the policy um, could be pretty significant. Although I, I do try to emphasize to people when you're thinking about long-term care insurance, um, or if you're thinking of that as one of the options, one of the possible things you might be wanting to do, don't like, first of all, don't, don't say no to yourself. Don't assume to yourself Oh, I'm too old, I can't do that. Um, because people, I've seen people get policies over 70 years old for long-term care insurance, depends on your health. Um, and don't assume that the premium is too high. So, you know, oftentimes I'll talk to folks and I'll say, so, so you know, you should, have you thought about long-term care insurance? And they'll say, oh no, the premium's too high. Well, how high is it? Well, too high. Well, no, that's not the correct answer, right? The correct answer is too high with relation to what, you know? It, it, so you, run, you want to kind of find out from these folks, you know, how much, what the, what the long-term care insurance cost would be. But a couple of things I want to mention to you about. The, the main reason that I talk to people and say maybe you want to consider long-term care insurance is that while... A long-term care insurance policy that will cover your nursing home care 
would have to be a very expensive policy since nursing home care runs from like $300 to $450 a day now. So, and that's a lot, right? Um, if you need care at home, a much smaller policy could really help you. And the issue is that if you need care at home, and of course that's, that's Frank and Mary's uh, goal, they, they never want to leave home, and, but they may run into situations, my clients often do, where they need some care in order to stay at home. Typically if Frank and Mary are at home, if Mary's got dementia or if Mary's got some, some serious physical problems, then Frank is going to be with her and is saying, I'm going to be with my wife. I'm going to take care of my wife. But we, don't, we want to make sure that Frank doesn't die doing that, right? That he does. I always tell my clients, you know, if, you're, if your spouse is sick, the worst thing you can do for them is die, right? Because then they're alone and sick, and that's really bad. So it may be that in that situation, Frank may want to be trying to take care of Mary at home. Um, but just can't do it all the time, you know, can't do it 24 seven, need some breaks, need some help kind of pick, you know, having, picking Mary up, you know, or helping Mary to take a shower or to dress, to do some things that might require some, some, some body strength that Frank might have trouble, you know, manipulating her, or he might just need a second person to help him do that. So there are a lot of reasons why he may want to have some help at home. Now, the thing about, that help. And by the way, folks will always tell me, well, you know, I want to make sure we stay at home because staying at home is cheaper than nursing home care. Well, actually, no, it's not. Uh, not if you're, you're at home 24-7 and you're getting care 24-7. There are, there are 8,760 hours in a year. There's a piece of trivia for you. Um, if, if the cost of care like it is around here is between $25 and $30 an hour if you're going to an agency, say it's $30 an hour, that means your care is about a quarter of a million dollars uh, at home, which is more than you'd pay if you were in a nursing home. But for Frank and Mary, they probably don't need 24-7 care. Maybe they need three hours of care a day, you know, uh, every day. So suppose you have a long-term care insurance policy that pays a benefit of $150 a day, which is not a big long-term care insurance policy. Well, divided by 30, that's five hours a day. So at five hours a day, it may very well be that Mary would be able to stay at home, right, with just Frank. Second thing is, um, the, the newer long-term care insurance policies also typically will cover your stay or part of your stay in assisted living if you can demonstrate that you, you need to be at assisted living, if your doctor certifies that you need to be in assisted living, not, not in a nursing home, but in assisted living, because you need assistance with the activities of daily living. If those activities of daily living are incorporated into the price of your assisted living bill, then typically that, for example, at $150 a day, could go to the, the assisted living facility. Now, $150 a day times 30 days is $4,500. That's really about what you would pay in an assisted living facility. That would cover all or practically all of, of your stay in many assisted living facilities. So there's, there's kind of a reason to be thinking about it. Finally, um, there is a particular policy that you might want to get if you're Frank and Mary and you specifically want to protect the home. And that is a policy, as long as you have a long-term care insurance policy that will pay you at least $125 dollars per day for at least two years worth of nursing home coverage uh, and as long as that policy is still in effect because you've kept paying the premiums and because you haven't used all um, two years worth of coverage on the day that you apply for mass health if you've gone from your home to a nursing home and you then apply for mass health when you qualify for Mass Health, which you will do, um, because you can qualify by simply telling them that you have a home, um, but that you have a, this long-term care insurance policy. When you qualify for Mass Health, Mass Health will not uh, and cannot put a lien on your home and can't uh, file a claim against your estate following your death for the value of that home. No matter what the home is worth, it can be worth a million dollars, right? So to the extent that, for, in Frank and Mary's case, their home is like about 50% of their assets. It's a really big asset. So to the extent that they want to, and this, by the way, is very common for folks who come in to talk to me. Oftentimes when they're talking about irrevocable trust, they'll say, well, 
you know, I want to keep control of my cash. I don't want to lose control of that. Um, but I really want to save the house. I want the house to go to the kids, which really doesn't mean they want the house to go to the kids. They want the, the proceeds from the house to go to the kids, right? So in that situation, that long-term care insurance policy, if they buy it, gives them the ability to keep control of, of really everything and not even lose control of their house because they know the house is safe. So long-term care insurance um, maybe is one of the things that you want to consider, okay? Second thing you want to consider, oh, oh and, and, and this is something maybe that you don't want to consider. This is, uh, this is kind of a by the way that I mention these. Um, so when you go to apply for mass health, one of the things that you, 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 you cannot qualify for mass health unless you have less than $2,000 in countable assets. But if you have a life insurance policy, uh, no matter how much the death benefit, unless it has a surrender value, uh, only the surrender value counts as an asset when you qualify for mass health. Well, some clever insurance company folks thought they figured out a way to, to basically really help people here. So, uh, I have seen these, these policies that have been offered recently called these hybrid, hybrid policies in which what you would do is you would buy a, you would pay a single premium for a very big life insurance policy that will also have a provision that will allow you to borrow against it right before you die. And the, so that suppose if you're Frank and Mary and you've got, uh, and you want to qualify for, or, or Frank's dead, Mary wants to qualify for Matt South, say she has $200,000 left in cash. Well, you could go buy, pay a single premium, $200,000 for the life insurance policy. Um, now, the, the, the death benefit may only be like $250,000, especially if Mary is, say, 85, right? Um, so the premium is almost as big as the death benefit. But technically, as a result of this, you have a, a, a life insurance policy and it doesn't have a cash surrender value. You can borrow against it, but it doesn't have a surrender value and therefore isn't an asset. Well, when, when this was first described to me, I said, I said to the person talking to me, I said, I hear what you're saying, but what that really sounds like isn't the purchase of a life insurance policy. It's, the purchase, it's basically a gift to the kids of the money that you just put into the life insurance policy and then when you die, well then the policy, you know, most of that money, the money is just going to get passed on. Well, sure enough, uh, um, a couple months ago, the New Mexico Supreme Court decided just that. They had that case. Somebody had bought one of these policies with a big, big premium shortly before they tried to qualify for Medicaid. Uh, the Medicaid folks turned them down and got appeal that went to the Supreme Court in New Mexico. Uh, and the court said, no, that wasn't really, that wasn't really a life insurance policy that you, that you bought. That was really a gift that you made to your kids. So if you hear su of such policies and they're being sold in this way, that they're a way of shielding, shielding money in, in the event that you need to qualify for mass health, I don't think that's going to work. I don't think it's going to work. Um, I'm going to mention one other thing regarding the, um, regarding the, uh, the, uh, the those small, um, um, long-term care insurance policies. There is a regulation that says that if you go into a nursing home and you say on your application you intend to return home, your house is not a countable asset. Um, MassHealth puts a lien on the house at that point to make sure that, that MassHealth gets paid back after your death. But it, is, it doesn't cause you to not qualify for MassHealth in the first place. The regulation says but only if the equity in the house is less than $840,000. Now, there has been an argument that because of that regulation, that number might also apply to long-term care insurance policies, that even if you have that long-term care insurance policy, if the equity is higher than $840,000, um, then, then it, the, the house may not be protected. This, a lot of this comes from a case that happened, I am told, in, on the Cape. I spoke to the insurance agent about this, um, in which that, the person had bought a long-term care insurance policy, house was worth, lived in the, on the Cape, house was worth more than a million dollars. They applied, and the caseworker denied the, the, the application. Um, but nobody appealed. So I guess I'm just telling you, if you hear of such a case, I want to know about that case because I want to appeal that case. Because I feel very comfortable that that long-term care insurance policy protects that house, no matter what the value. Um, uh, so that's, oops, I just want to mention one of the, 
Second thing you want to think about, reverse mortgages. Oh, as soon as I talk to people, no, I don't want a reverse mortgage. They're a terrible. They're going to take my, they mean to, they get your house, right? They, they, t these are terrible. So, so not everybody should get a reverse mortgage, but let me talk reverse mortgages through with you. To understand a reverse mortgage, you have to understand home equity loans. Everybody here has home, heard of a home equity loan, right? So what's a home equity loan, really? Uh, it's a loan that you get from the bank, but it's a line of credit, right, typically. No, I think all of the ones that I've seen, they're lines of credit. So you go to the bank and you say, based on the value of your house, they'll give you a percentage of the value of your house as a line of credit. And, the tr and, and, and you'll sign in return for that line of credit a promissory note, a promise to pay back the bank. And the promise will say that while you don't owe the bank anything until you've withdrawn some money from the line of credit, if you pull some money out of the line of credit, from the day that you pull that money out, from there on, you have to start paying the bank interest. You start owing the bank interest. And that interest has to be paid monthly. And if you don't pay the bank the monthly interest, well, then that's a default under that promissory note that you signed, and also, therefore, a default under the mortgage so the bank can foreclose. So the, the terms of the, of the home equity loan are you have to make the payments every month. Uh, you can't sell the house. The, the, the reverse mortgage is also due on, due on sale if you sell the house. You also can't die. N nobody kind of notices this provision, but there's also a provision that says that death is a default under the terms of the mortgage. So you have to get it, you have to get it taken care of or rewrite it after you die, or somebody does uh, after you die. So, so what is the difference between that and a reverse mortgage? Well, really very little. When you get a reverse mortgage, what you do is you apply to the reverse mortgage company. Instead of giving you a loan simply based on the, the fair market value of the house, and, and typically I've seen re, you know, regular home equity loans can go up to as high as like 75% of the value of the house. The value will be based on the value of your house. Now, I'm just using this as an example because um, it, it, it's based on the value of your house, except that it, even if you have a very valuable house, there's a maximum value that they use. And when I say they, reverse mortgages are all controlled by the federal government. They were actually kind of invented by the federal government um, because all reverse mortgages are insured by the federal government, the Federal Housing Administration. Um, they're the only reason why banks are willing to do reverse mortgages, because if as a result of their doing their reverse mortgage, they end up with a, with a mortgage debt that is much higher than the value of the house, um, the federal government pays. That the, they're all federally insured. Now, because they're federally insured, they're also heavily regulated by HUD, by the Department of Housing and Urban Development. And among those regulations is this regulation that says, that there is a maximum value that you can use in calculating a reverse mortgage. And that value goes up with inflation. Today, it is that number, $636,150. Now, just for purposes of you know, giving you a sense of, of how these numbers might work, um, if Frank and Mary applied for that reverse mortgage, and, they were, and the younger of the two of them was 75 years old, the, value, the amount that the, that, that, that the bank will, or the reverse mortgage company will give you on a reverse mortgage um, is related to your age. It's related to the value of the house and also to your age. But if you use that, that $636,000 value, and if the younger of the two of Frank and Mary were 75 years old, <clears throat> you would have, or they would have about $312,000 available to them, or uh, a little less than 50% um, of the... Uh, of the value of, of that $636,000 value. Once again, if the house value were lower, the, 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 percentage, would, the percentage would change. If, they were, if the younger of the two of them, and whenever you figure out this number, it's always based on the, the age of the younger of the two spouses, if there were two spouses. If the younger of the two of them were 85, then the amount that would be available would be $375,000, or about 60% of the, of the total value. So, the, the amount that is available goes up the, higher, the older that you are. Another feature, though, of, of reverse mortgages is that if, if, you, if you have a line of credit from one of these reverse mortgages and you don't use it, and you haven't used it, then at the end of every year, the, un, the, 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 the banks look at the unused line of credit and they add something to it. They'll add 
4% or 5% or they'll add some percentage so that the amount that's available to you if you haven't used it grows over time. Okay, so that's how they do the calculation. It depends on age. Um, and it's just like a home equity loan except, so if you don't use it and you haven't borrowed any of the money, then, there's, then you don't owe them any money any, every month. Um, if you have used it, then from the time you've borrowed some money, the interest starts accruing on that amount of money and only on that amount. But at the end of the month, if you can't pay it, the, the interest simply gets added to the principal. And then the following month, the principal goes up by that small amount. So let me use you an, ex let me use you an example. Say that Frank and Mary had done this, bar had, had, had done this and had, borrowed, and had a line of credit, and they borrowed $100,000. The interest rates on these right now, around 5%. And interestingly, that's another thing about the reverse mortgages, is that if you compare them, if you com they, they come as adjustables or they come as fixed rate. And if you compare the interest rates, you're gonna find they're approximately the same as the rates that you'd pay at the bank right now. So if, if you say they borrowed $100,000, 5% 100, of $100,000 is, is $5,000. Divide $5,000 by 12, you can get a sense of how much it is monthly. So it's a little over $400 a month. So if, at the, if they borrowed $100,000 for a month, and at the end of the month, they didn't pay it, right? Then that $400 would get added to the $100,000. So the following month, they would, they would owe on 5% of $100,400. And that's the way it slowly grows. So it, like regular, like any mortgage, you can pay the mortgage off at any time, right? They could also, if they wanted to keep the amount of the outstanding amount the same, they could always just pay their monthly interest bill. The point is though, they don't have to. They don't have to. So for a lot of clients who have got a house that's worth a lot of money, they may very well have some cash, so they don't need money right now, but, you know, the goal of life when you get to our age is to not lose sleep. They don't want to lose sleep. They want to know that even if there's some kind of emergency and they need this extra cash, there's going to be cash available. In that case, having the reverse mortgage might be very handy. So the reverse mortgage is only due, is not due when the, when the monthly payment is due. It's only due if you die. And it's not due right away in that case. It's actually due one year following the date of death. So, if you had a reverse mortgage and you died, your kids would have one year uh, um, from that date to either refinance, you know, if the, if the kids were living in the house or whatever, uh, or to sell the house and pay off the mortgage. And the amount that would be due, like any other mortgage, would be the amount, of, amount that you borrowed plus the amount of interest, okay? Now, so the, the, the possible the default is if you die, uh, if you sell the house, just like if there's a regular home equity loan, or if you stop living in the house for 365 consecutive days. So what I tell my clients is, if you have one of these reverse mortgages and you end up going, say, to assisted living or going to a nursing home, once a year, go back to your house. Take a little break, and the, monthly, the yearly anniversary, go back to your house, maybe take a picture of yourself at the house, you know, maybe take a picture of a newspaper from that day, you know. To, so that you can, so that's just in case anybody ever checks. Although I have yet to see a reverse mortgage company that checks on any of this stuff. Now, I know a reasonable amount, I know what lawyers tend to know about reverse mortgages, but they're more complicated than that. So I asked my friend Steve Greenberg, Steve, Steve actually does reverse mortgages, just to talk to you for a couple of minutes about reverse mortgages. Uh, so I don't get refer. I don't like get money from him. You know, I don't get a percentage of the. Reverse. This isn't a sale, but I wanted you to actually actually see a real person who does reverse mortgages. If you have any questions afterwards, he'll be around. Steve, uh, it, just a, I want to do answers right at the end, man. If you could, yes. Thank you, Arthur. Thank you, everybody, for coming today. I really appreciate you taking the time out of your day. Um, Arthur really makes my job quite easy because he is extremely knowledgeable about this product. It doesn't leave me a whole lot to say by the time I get up here, which is a nice thing. Um, I've been in the reverse mortgage business for 12 years now, and this is the only product that I have ever had during that 12 year period. And I've been working with our five, six years now, I think somewhere right in that yeah. neck of the woods. And the most important thing that Art says 
is that realize, don't assume. That's the most important thing is don't assume. Um, a reverse mortgage, it's regulated by HUD. It's insured by FHA. The only thing that they don't do is lend the money, and that's where we come in and lend the funds under their rules, under their regulations. And if we don't follow those, we're not in the reverse mortgage business anymore. So the biggest thing is, is that a reverse mortgage is simply an option. It is a piece of the puzzle that may or may not fit in with your retirement plans. We're talking options, wills, um, irrevocable trusts, long-term care insurance. All of these things should be put into that pie to figure out what's going to be the best option for you. Arthur also mentioned the line of credit and the line of credit growth. These are all based on actuarial tables. The older you are, the more access to equity you get, so therefore that line of credit will grow year after year after year. The other very important feature about a reverse mortgage is that they are known as what is, what is known as a non-recourse loan. Very important term, non-recourse loan. And what that simply means is that the only asset the lender has to recoup its dollars is the value of the property. So as Arthur mentioned, if you ever get in that position where you owe more on the mortgage than the home is worth, your estate is not responsible, any assets of your estate, any mm -hmm. heirs of your estate, or quite frankly, if you're still alive and decided that it's time to move to Florida or Carolinas or whatever it might be, and you're in that position, you're not responsible for it. That's where that insurance comes in and makes the bank whole. So, I mean, just to, oh, one other thing I should say too about that line of credit and with Arthur, with the Medicaid planning, is that any of those dollars in that line of credit is also a non-countable asset. So again, the important things, don't assume. Look at all the pieces of that puzzle that may or may not fit into your plan. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Yeah. So I'm, I'm just going to take up on one of those points. So if you, if the way Mass Health works, if you need to be qualifying for Mass Health, and I just mentioned Mass Health just because I spent a lot of time talking about that. <laughs> People talk about it, is that once you have qualified, and in this case, if Frank and Mary qualified because they still own their home and they could, even if they didn't have long-term care insurance, once they qualified. Um, then the rule is that their income, their monthly pension or social security has to go to the nursing home, MassHealth pays the rest. If they had any other sources of income, for example, if they had long-term care insurance, the long-term care insurance payment would have to go to the nursing home. If they have a reverse mortgage though, and they haven't tapped it, they still have a line of credit, and, and one of them is in the nursing home and needs some additional care, because in the nursing home, when you're on MassHealth, for example, you're not going to get physical therapy. You're not going to, it's custodial. It's not, it's not the extras. You can buy that physical care using that line of credit. And taking that money out isn't considered to be income, and therefore it doesn't have to get paid to the nursing home. One thing, finally, which I discovered about five or six months ago. You know, you do this year for year after year. You start thinking you know everything, and then you learn a new thing. So I, was, I, I had always assumed that reverse mortgages, like home equity loans, uh, if you then, oh, if you had one and wanted to put your property into an irrevocable trust because you wanted to do it for mass health protection purposes, we're going to get to that a little bit later on, that, that, you needed, and that you needed to get the assent of the bank in order to do that. Um, and I assume that that applied to reverse mortgages. Until this spring, I had a client who was exactly in that situation. That she, you know, she didn't have her cash left. Um, she had a reverse mortgage with a little bit of a line left. Um, she wanted to protect her house. She's in like her early 90s. She wants to protect the house for the kids. So she wanted to put the house into an irrevocable trust. And I said, I, you know, I think we need the bank's permission, but I'll check. And then I went and read her reverse mortgage. And much to my amazement, it said that as long as she retained any interest in the property, um, in this case, she retained a life estate in the property. We're going to talk about that. Even though she transferred the so-called remainder interest in the property to an irrevocable trust, as long as she kept an interest, that, that meant that the mortgage was still valid, no permission was needed from the bank, 
and the transfer of the interest to the irrevocable trust did not constitute a default under the mortgage. So it was like a, it was like a big deal. That's, it, it, that's not the case with home equity loans. With home equity loans, you need to get the permission of the bank. Okay? Um, <clears throat> the other uh, uh, reverse mortgage you can get is from the town, um, and that's called tax deferral. Um, by Massachusetts law, if you are 62 years of, old, years of age or older, and if you're a couple, if one of you is 62 or older, and you've lived in the Commonwealth for 10 years, uh, and you lived in your home for at least five years, um, then you can go to the assessor's office under certain circumstances and ask them to defer, uh, or not ask them to defer it, tell them that you want to defer the payment of your taxes until after you die or sell the house. And they're required to do that. Now, this is in addition to any uh, abatements that you could otherwise get from the town because you're a veteran for whatever other reason, okay? Um, now, there are two rules that you need to, that you need to check on regarding your town. And I apologize that I didn't call the assessors and check today. One is that the state says that the, that the, that the assessors have to do this as long as you're making below a particular income amount. I know that the state number below which the towns cannot go is $20,000 a year, and that's not a lot of money. But, you're but the towns are allowed to go as high as the mid-60s. I'm, do you know what the number is here? I, I'm going to try to get that so that when this goes up on the, on the, in the Hopkinton, in the, uh, in the YouTube channel, in, in their channel, or when we rebroadcast this on YouTube, we'll have that number. I know that, for example, in Marlboro, the number is about $65,000. So the, in many communities, they've, they've done that. The second thing is the town can charge you interest on that money. It's not compounded, but they can charge you interest. Now, the maximum they can charge you is 8%, but the towns can charge you as little as zero. I know that, for example, in my hometown, that's what they charge. I think they charge 0%. And, and the rationale for that is just that, hey, you know, you're, 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 not, you're not trying to beat the system here. You've been a taxpayer for a long time. You lived in town for a long time. And the town feels like this is, this is a benefit. They're not losing a lot. They're going to get their money. They have a lien on the property that's going to cause them to be able to get their money back, right? But they want you to stay in your house. They want you to stay. So you should check it. You should check it if you're a senior. Um, do you need an irrevocable trust? Now, to answer that, I'm going to answer all questions at the end. It, do you need an irrevocable trust? Now, yes or no? If you're Frank and Mary, then the answer is probably no. And here's why. Um, here's Mass Health 101. Mass Health 101. Once again, assume that they own a house worth $400,000 and they have other assets worth $500,000. And then that Mary either needs nursing home care or needs a lot of care at home and, and therefore wants to qualify for the Mass Health program that will qualify her to get some hours uh, of care at home. In either of those cases, she, need, she and Frank need to meet cert, certain asset and income criteria. Uh, her criterion is she has to have less than $2,000 in countable assets. Um, Frank, though, can own the home no matter what it's worth. Um, Frank can have other assets worth $120,900, and he can have unlimited income, unlimited income, as long as those income streams can't be converted into cash. It isn't like an annuity that you can surrender and get all the money out, or an IRA or a 401k. If it's just an income stream, Frank can have unlimited income. Therefore, if Mary needs to qualify for Mass Health today, she can simply shift all of her interest to Frank, including the house and all the cash. Frank would then keep, say, $100,000. He's allowed to keep as much as $120,900. But we always recommend that he keep a little less than that when he uses this strategy. Uh, and then he goes and buys an annuity. As long as that annuity does not have a surrender value and calls for equal monthly payments over a term that is shorter than Frank's actuarial life expectancy. And if Frank were, say, 85 at this point, his life expectancy would be about seven years. Um, then the purchase of that annuity in any amount is a legitimate conversion from a countable asset to a non-countable income stream. So the day after Frank buys the annuity, Mary qualifies for Mass Health. So day one, Mary shifts all the assets to Frank. Day two, Frank buys this annuity, thereby dropping his cash assets below $120,900. Day three, Mary qualifies for Mass Health. From then on, Mary's income, Mary's Social Security or pension, would get paid to the nursing home. Frank's income would all be safe. 
Now, I just want to mention this one thing. With, with this, this, uh, the la as I mentioned in this last line here, under current regulations, when Frank buys that annuity, he can name anybody he wants as a death beneficiary. That is, a beneficiary who would receive the remaining annuity payment after he died. Because these annuities, they're always for a term. They're not until death. And therefore, if you, if you die during the term, the annuity company keeps paying the payments, right? So right now, he could simply name his kids as the beneficiaries of those payments. There is a proposed rules change, which we believe uh, in, the, in the elder law community will be adopted, which will say that in that situation, Mass Health, if they had paid benefits on Mary's behalf, would have a claim against those remaining payments to get reimbursed. That change is probably going to happen. It, when it does, it's going to put Massachusetts in, in alignment with probably 40 other states, right, which have already done this, right? So that's why we think this is going to happen. And in that situation, that's why we, in that situation, we would recommend to Frank that he get an annuity in that case as short as possible so that he can get his money back. Why is that? Because once he has the money back, together with the house, as long as he has his will say that upon his death, all assets that would have gone to Mary if she's still alive will instead go in trust for Mary's benefit, and he can name the kids as the trustees, and he can name anybody he wants, then all of those assets upon his death would be safe, would continue to be safe, not countable, that would not cause Mary to lose her mass health benefits, they could not get lean then by mass health. So in this situation, going back to that earlier question, did Frank and Mary need an irrevocable trust? The answer is really no, as long as their goal is to make sure that while they're alive, they know everything's going to be fine. They want to make sure that if one of them dies, the other one is safe. So they should probably do this wills change now, as opposed to waiting until the last minute. Because you don't want to be, have, you know, Frank have a stroke and we think he's going to die pretty soon. And now we, we're talking about, oh, how can we make the assets safe for Mary? But Frank has to sign a new will. But he really can't because he's had a stroke and he can't do it, right? So you want to get the will done ahead of time. The asset shifting does not have to be done ahead of time. It only has to be done before the first spouse dies, okay? Now, the question then though is, what if Frank has died and all the assets have gone to Mary? Because remember, that was their original plans, that if one died, everything went to Mary. Well, in that case, if Mary does want to have that protection in the event that she needs to qualify for mass health, either because she's in a nursing home or because she wants a lot of care at home, um, then she's going she's gonna to need to transfer the assets out of her name and wait five years to get that kind of protection. Otherwise, she's going to have to spend those assets other than the house down to $2,000 um, and the home will be subject to a mass health lien. Now, once again, kind of in parentheses, if you're in that situation, there's a way to do that. There are a couple of options available to you to get those assets down below $2,000. One of them is to, is to have Mary buy an annuity, um, and then the other is to put the money in so, into a so-called D4C pooled trust. We're not going to go through that today. That's one of those really technical presentations that we do on occasion that I'll probably do again uh, next year, because some of those rules are changing. But the bottom line is that if Mary wants to protect against that situation, then what she needs to do is transfer her, if she's trying to save the house, she needs to transfer the home out, either to her kids or to an irrevocable trust. Typically, she would keep a life estate in the house so that she'd have complete control over the house as long as she was alive. She'd retain the responsibility for paying the bills, like the taxes and the insurance. Kids couldn't throw her out of the house. This is something I always hear. Just throw me out, you know? And unfortunately, I've had that, seen that happen. Not a lot, but it's the kind of thing that keeps you up at night. Once again, the goal is to not lose sleep, right? So, so that's the way to do it if you're single uh, and you want to protect any assets. You need to get them out of your name. You need to wait five years. Um, traps for the unwary. If you have done, if you are doing those things, you need to make sure that you pay attention to what might happen if you do the transfer and then you want to just sell your house because you want to move, because you want to go to assisted living, because you're going to Florida for whatever reason. In that case, if you've simply transferred your interest in your house to your kids, it may very well be that there's going to be a capital gains tax that is due in that if you go to sell the house. That's one of the reasons why instead often people will once again keep a life estate, transfer this interest to an irrevocable trust 
He keeps some, without going into detail, some magic provisions in the irrevocable trust that make the trust be grantor taxable so that if you need to sell the house, you don't pay the tax. Uh, trust provisions, don't make yourself one of the trustees of these trusts. I just had this happen again that somebody came in and they, they got advised a long time ago, it's an older trust, by a lawyer trying to tell them they could have it both ways. So they put their house in an irrevocable trust, but they became the trustees of the trust. That has not yet been knocked down by Mass Health, but it's going to be. We just know. So you don't want to do that. Um, there is this other obscure little provision. If you've got an existing trust, you want to, may want to be sensitive to. Um, if your trust says, if you're an older person, that you retain the power to, you, to designate through your trust that some of the proceeds, some or all of them, will go to a nonprofit organization. Um, that sounds like a pretty innocuous provision. But in this recent case called Hein, H-E-Y-N, um, the court referred to the fact that in that situation, it could be argued because about 40% of all the nursing homes in Massachusetts are owned by nonprofits, that if you retain the power to give money to a nonprofit organization, you really retain the power to use the value of your house to pay for a nursing home. Uh, now, I'm not going to go further than that, but, just in, but simply to say, if you've got that kind of provision in your trust now, you should probably try to get it changed. Finally, um, if, you have, if you just thought this was a very exciting show but want to see it again because I talk too fast, Frank and Mary have their own YouTube channel, Elder Law Frank and Mary. Also, the folks at Hopkinton Cable have been kind enough to film these shows for, I think, the last four years or five years and to replay them. So thank you very much to um, Hopkinton Cable. Thank you. Any questions regarding any of this? I thought I saw a question that was here, and then I was going to go there. Oh, you, ma'am? Yeah. 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 If you, if I ha you have a reverse mortgage, and then what happens? If the economy goes down, does anything? If the you have a reverse mortgage and the economy goes down, does that change anything? No. No. You're, the line of credit that they've given you and the rules regarding the, the expansion of the line of credit all stay in place, right? And once again, and, and, and so that's why you'd say to yourself, well, why would banks do this? And the reason is because they're federally insured. It's the only way that the federal government could get banks to do it, and they wanted banks to do it because they wanted people to have this ability to tap into their equity. That answer your question? Yeah, okay. Uh, yes, ma'am, and then you, sir. Yes, ma'am. Uh, I have a question. On that reverse mortgage, mm -hmm. you have the husband and wife in the house. Mm -hmm. Say the husband dies, and he may either be um, like the sole owner of the house. Does the wife have to leave? Does everything become doable then? Or if the, if the, to the question is what happens if the reverse mortgage is just in the husband's name and the husband dies. It's my understanding that in that situation, that's a problem. And that's why if you did the reverse mortgage, you'd want to have it in both names. Am I wrong about that? That's a change in the policy. There's been, you know, that's why I had them, right? <laughs> that's why I, <laughs> is that if both of you are on the mortgage, then in that situation, nothing changes. Everything stays the same. If one of you is on the mortgage, there are now rules implemented that are called for non-borrowing spouses, which now allow you to stay in the home. So that problem that we did have be before has gone away. Been addressed by HUD. So, so in other words, there, there wouldn't be any more any remaining line of credit. So the surviving right. spouse couldn't pull money out, but but the, but the but the reverse mortgage wouldn't wouldn't come due until the surviving Correct. spouse had died. So, right. so then. So. You wouldn't have access to the dollars because you're not a borrower. To any new dollars. To any new dollars. But depending on the map, depending on the situation, you might be able to refinance the reverse in your name and get gain, garner some extra dollars. It depends on the map, depends on the situation right. to see if everything works. But in the meantime, but if you the couldn't do thing right. is, is that you're able to stay in the home if you are not on the loan these days. No matter what. That answers that question. Yes, sir. And then you, ma'am. Yes, sir. Yep. Oh, now you're going to make it hard for me here now. You've got to do them one at a time because I don't remember stuff. They've got to be, they got to be quick. I'll do them so. Thank you. Um, in talking about your trust, you have consistently mentioned irrevocable trusts. Presumably by your comment about Mary not being a trustee, a revocable trust would not give any of those protections. The question is whether a re having a property in a revocable trust gives you any protection. The answer is no. The whole idea behind a revocable trust, as the name implies, is that you can revoke it. 
right? You can cancel it out, you can take the property back, and therefore, as far as Mass Health is concerned, you still own it. Second question. Second question is you mentioned towns can allow you to defer taxes. Mm -hmm. um, in the same way with the reverse mortgage, you can put the house in trust. Can you put your house in trust if you have a tax deferral by state law, or does that depend on town ordinance? If my recollection serves, you, you need to own the property in order to do tax deferral, as opposed to having the property in trust. So it cannot go in trust. That's correct. Third question is, the estate tax, I believe, is a million dollars. Is that for individual, or is it two million for a couple? The estate tax, now, th now that's, that's a longer topic. The, the, the estate, the Massachusetts estate tax kicks in when an individual dies having an estate of worth, worth more than a million dollars. The taxable estate, though, does not include assets that, go, that are given to the surviving spouse. So if, if, if in Frank and Mary's case, Frank died and left everything to Mary, his taxable estate would be zero. If Mary then died, though, the next day, her taxable estate would be everything that she had. If that, if the, and if that caused her taxable estate to be more than a million dollars, there'd be an estate tax. A common way of avoiding that um, is to have, is to have par the parties each say, when I die, a piece of the money that would have gone to my spouse will instead go in trust for the benefit of my spouse. In that particular case, the spouse can actually be the trustee and control the money for his or her own benefit. But because it has some other magic language in it, for tax purposes, the money that goes into that trust is considered to be still part of the estate of the first person to die. As long as that amount that goes into trust is less than a million dollars, though, there's no estate tax on that. And if by doing that, the first person to die has reduced the estate of the second person to die for up by up to a million dollars, because that money went into that trust, then effectively, even though they started off with $2 million, they may end up at the end of the day with no one paying any tax, because the first estate it was worth less than a million dollars, the second estate was worth less than a million dollars. That's a very brief summary in answer to that question. Now, you had, I had yes, ma'am. You just added to my question, it, what you just explained, is that what they call a credit shelter trust? And sometimes the, the trust that I just described is called a credit shelter trust. Very good. <laughs> Congratulations. You know, my parents said that. Yep. Um, I do, I'm not as um, knowledgeable as it sounded. Um, if you have a vacation home and you want to protect that for, uh, from your taxes for the kids, what's the best way to handle that? If you have a vacation home, and the question is how to protect that, um, well, there are a couple of things on that. One, if you have a vacation home and you're in the Frank and Mary case, right, that's the one case where, I shouldn't say that's the one case, but that's about the only case where even though you're both alive, you may want to transfer the property out of your names, especially if you're going to be leaving the vacation home to your kids, because the kids love the house, whenever it's on a cape, blah, blah, blah. I do this a lot on Martha's Vineyard in Nantucket. This happens like a lot. Um, you transfer that house into an irre irrevocable trust and wait the f um, keep a life estate and wait the five years. Because in the, in, the, in the example that I gave you, if you're Frank and Mary, and Mary goes into the nursing home, and in order to qualify for mass health, she has to shift everything to Frank, Frank, their home is exempt, but everything else has to, they have to use to buy an annuity. In that case, if there was a, if there was a vacation home, um, Frank would have to sell the vacation home. He'd have to turn the, the vacation home into cash because he can't have other assets of more than $120,900, and that would include the vacation home. So in that situation, for mass health purposes, that's what, he want, that's what they'd want to do. For tax purposes, this, this, there, there isn't anything different between the vacation home or any of the other assets. What you want to try to do is structure things so that at the end of the day, when each, when each spouse dies, that spouse has, a, a, has an estate, a taxable estate of less than a million dollars. If that means you need to split the assets, as I just mentioned to this person over here, then that's what you want to do. If your total assets are worth less than a million dollars, you don't have to worry about that. Can but you explain it, to me what I, life estate means? A, sure. A life estate. When I own real estate, I own it, if you re look, re go back and look at your deed, you got, you got your property in fee. You were conveyed a fee interest in the property. What in the world does that mean? It's an 1100-year-old word, and it means 
that you own this whole bundle of things. You own the property from the sky above to the, earth, to the middle of the earth, to the, you know, actually to before they knew that it was, there was a middle to the earth, I guess to the bottom of the earth. You, you own, and, and you also own it until the end of time, if you live that long. Um, and if you die in the meantime, then by virtue of owning property in fee, that means their property goes into your estate, right? Um, and through your estate, either through will to somebody else or through the rules of intestacy to your decedents. Now, you have the right during your lifetime to divide up that, that length of time that you own the property into pieces. Actually, that's what a lease is. When you give somebody a lease, you're actually giving them that time, a piece of that time to which to use the property. You can also divide it up into the period before you die and the period after you die. And if you keep the period before you die, that's called a life estate. And then you can convey, right now, the, the ownership of the property after you die. It's called a remainder interest. The people that you transfer it to are called remainder men. And the legal effect of that is that while you're alive, you own it. You know, you have the right to mortgage it and, well, except that the remainder men would have to sign also because if I were the bank, I'd want to know that I could foreclose both before and after you die. Um, but you have the obligation to pay the taxes and the insurance and the right to do with it what you want and rent it out and get the rent. That's a life estate. The right to do all those things while you're alive. But it, in, it dies at the moment that you die. There were a couple of other questions, and I'll come back. Okay, is that okay? Yes, sir. All right. <clears throat> Why don't you go back to the long-term care policy, the hybrid-type policy? Does, are they useful to qualify for a mass health? Uh, the, are the, are the long-term care insurance policies? No. The life insurance policy? The, the, no. The hybrid type. That the one that I had given you? Th no. Hybrids, hybrids have the life insurance piece and then this other piece that allows you to pull money out, right? But I, I guess what I'm telling you, in all, in all of those cases, let me put it this way, the closer you are to trying to qualify for mass health at the time you buy the policy, and therefore the bigger the premium you're paying in relationship to the total value of the policy, the more likely it is that mass health is going to say that was just a gift. So if you're buying one of these policies and you're in your 60s, you know, and there's got a, but it's got this, this, this element to it that you can borrow against the policy, et cetera, I'd say, fine. You know, and, you're, and maybe you're paying a, you know, an annual premium, you know, five, six, ten, twelve thousand dollars $12,000, and it's a million dollar policy. You're, if you're paying $200,000 for a $300,000 policy, you know, that's going to be challenged. It's going to be challenged. It will, it will, well, the, 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 issue, the, the issue is kind of when you buy it in relationship to, to, to how old you are, right? Because that's going to determine all those risks, I think. If you bought it five, ten years earlier, right. and it has a long-term portion, yeah. according to the regular, and it's tax deductible, that, that payment double, it has the element of just a long-term care policy with no life insurance residual. I'm, I'm just saying that if it, were, if it is, if it is, I mean, if it looks like what you just did, right, was that, you know, your health wasn't good, you just used whatever cash you had, put it into the policy in order to turn it into a life insurance policy, chances are MassHealth is going to challenge that and they're going to succeed. That's the only point I was trying to make. Uh, other questions in that case? I'll take this question, then I'm done. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Uh, it has to do also with the uh, long-term health care insurance. Um, I maybe like a lot of people, we bought long term health care insurance, but we bought it to help with future care. I had no idea about it protecting the house. Now, if we didn't have it, the house would not be protected. If you, of course, we have it, it is. If you have a long term care, if you have a long term care insurance policy that will pay at least $125 a day for at least two years, and if you haven't exhausted that policy at the time that you're applying to Mass Health, in other words, you haven't used up all two years' worth. Even if the spouse also has? Yeah, none of this makes any difference. If, if, you, if, you, if you have that policy and you go into a nursing home, you qualify for Mass Health, Mass Health does not have a right to put a lien on your house. Mass Health does not have a right to file a claim against your estate for the value of that house after you die. Your house is safe by virtue of you having that policy. And if we didn't have it, it wouldn't be that, No, then, then Mass Health would qualify you. But Mass Health would then put a lien on the house, I and 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 and, and, and it's protected the house, no matter what. Remember, if you're married, 
right, and one of you goes into a nursing home, you also have the option, w whether or not you have long-term care insurance, of simply shifting the house to the, sp to the other spouse, and then that protects the house, right? But if the spouse has died and you're single and you still own that house, that house is still safe by virtue of the fact that you have that long-term care insurance policy. Okay? Uh, I think I, I've got, it's just 11, so I think I'm going to stop. I'll take any other questions as individual questions afterwards. I'm glad to stay. Thank you very much for coming. Look forward to seeing you at the next presentation. Thank you all.